I am so excited because I have Mark Fraunmeyer. He is the entrepreneur, a founder, and president of Arcomoto. The reason I'm so excited, Mark, to have you is that your company represents my tagline better than my own company. I built a company based on a tagline of make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. And I have had hundreds and hundreds of people on the playbook, celebrities, entrepreneurs, billionaires, millionaires, entertainers, and nobody epitomizes my motto better than the FUV company. I mean, in its essence, that seems to be what your vision is, is to make a lot of money, help a lot of people and have a lot of fun. Well, Dave, thanks a lot for having me on the program. Yeah, our, our, our mission, I mean, at, at, its, at, its, at its root is to help catalyze the shift to a sustainable transportation system. Um, I mean, I guess in, in, in doing so, to, to really actually do that, that means we've got to build a lot of vehicles. Um, and, you know, uh, the, to me, the, the fun factor is uh, it's sort of the, the spoonful of sugar that helps the clean tech medicine go down. So uh, I think there, there are elements uh, in there that, that, that definitely, definitely vibe. It's so cool to hear you say that. Now, on that, there's also like a bigger goal, you know, in the technological terms that you have stated, there's a bigger goal is to help humanity and to create, you know, an affordable, efficient, everyday fun vehicle. Um, but as easy as that sounds, there's so many different regulatory uh, scientific technological hurdles that you have had to overcome in order to effectuate uh, being able to distribute this vehicle. What were some of the biggest challenges that, you know, the common public probably won't even think about when you're trying to create your own, your own category of vehicle? Well, um, wh where do I start? Uh, <laughs> vehicles, uh, vehicles are probably one of the hardest kinds of businesses to do in the world. Uh, I mean, you, you're talking about something that is, um, has obviously a, 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 an incredibly uh, large regulatory framework, not just on, I mean, at every level of government. So um, whether, when it comes to sales of vehicles, when it comes to safety of vehicles, when it comes to um, distribution into different areas, uh, it is a, it, you know, so, so the, that component of it is, is certainly a big piece. But I would say probably the, the, the first biggest challenge of Arkimoto was just figuring out what was the right thing that solves the, the, our, our typical kind of daily driving needs, um, but does so an order of magnitude more efficiently than a typical car. Um, and that's really what, what we spent our first seven years trying to figure out was how do we, you know, because the way that we use cars on a regular basis is just, it's, it's typically one or two people driving with a relatively small amount of stuff on you know, about 30 miles every day. Um, so the, the question for us has really always been, how do we build something that serves that need, which is like 80% plus of the trips out there, but does so without 4,000 pounds of steel? powered by internal combustion. Um, and that, that process of really trying to understand what was, you know, what, what is the utility need of the market? And then how do we do that um, at, at much more efficiently and uh, you know, consequently at a much lower price? That was, that was it took us, um, and, you know, we actually went through eight distinct product concept iterations over those first seven-ish years. And it wasn't until uh, you know, idea number eight that that we really felt like we landed on a sweet spot in this kind of next gen mobility space. Um, there were certainly there's certainly been many other challenges along the way, uh, but but getting to the right idea was uh, was 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 primary. That's amazing. I think even a bigger accomplishment coming from an entrepreneurial and venture capital uh, perspective is how did you stay financed? for those seven years in order to effectuate eight iterations of your amazing design? Well, so, so I, I kicked in pretty much all the seed financing from the proceeds of uh, the sale of my first company. So I was once upon a time, I was a video game maker uh, and sold a company in 2007. And actually I went looking for a product that didn't exist. And that's sort of why Arkimoto came into being. Um, but uh, uh, this was, so, so I first went out to go find you know, venture capital um, in 2009, and if you remember 2009, 
I do, unfortunately. 2007 <laughs> might have been a good year to sell a company, but 2009 was a horrible year to go looking for venture. So after getting uh, laughed off of Sand Hill Road, I, I went to friends and family and then uh, had to make new friends and family stopped returning phone calls. But right around, right around 2015, and this is really, I mean, this was to the point. So we, we did the, really the, you know, the, the um, uh, yeah, it was a seven year grind uh, just working with a very small dedicated team to get to the right idea. And then um, in, w- once we felt like we really had that right idea, that was actually when we got our first venture capital was from, uh, from, from Bill Hambrecht's third venture fund. Um, we, we sort of took the napkin sketch and some renderings down to the Bay Area in early 2015. Um, and, and that really, it hit his thesis of disruption. And he was a you know, sort of old school Clayton Christensen disruption theory guy. Um, and that, that, you know, he was also one of the very early proponents of uh, the Jobs Act modifications to Regulation A. So he kicked in the venture capital and then really uh, in order to propel us to going public, uh, which we did in 2017, in order to build out the factory. So it's, it's been, um, it, it, cap, I, you know, the, the second major challenge of the organization, and this is true of, of vehicle companies, I think generally is, you know, capital formation is, is a big hurdle. Yeah. You know, what's so interesting is I was looking at this and, you know, I see so many different deals and some of them, I'm like, how come no one's ever thought of this before? And then you find out it took, you know, seven, eight years to truly, you know, execute on a thought. And it makes me, you know, once again, appreciate what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Now, one of the other things I want people to learn about, and you probably have a great perspective on, is when we're dealing with technology and design, that there's an interesting um reconciliation that occurs. And the best example I give is I've worked with the Department of Defense in building huge Navy ships or stadiums. You know, I've been a consultant about technology and the the ships take 17 years to build. And so there's no way to design the technology of a ship at the beginning that they actually have to build it with technology that they know they have to tear out when they finally have the final touches. I would think there's the same type of reconciliation that occurs in a ship or a stadium build. You know, it's hard enough for three years of stadium build that you're designing something that the technology changes how to design it over the seven years that you're designing it. How much of that interplayed with the progression of your idea? Well, I I think that's a really interesting point, particularly given the electric vehicle, the progression of sort of the electric vehicle landscape, which happened over the last decade. I mean, it really, and I would say really still is kind of the wild west in terms of EV tech. Uh, batteries are an ever-shifting, um, you, know, you know, sort of this downward moving target in terms of price and uh, upward in terms of performance. Um, and so, so that, you know, f- for us, we really just said our, our core innovation, at least initially, was in the architecture of the vehicle itself. We, we didn't make early on a lot of bets on, uh, you know, battery technology or uh, novel motor topologies or or new electronics. Um, we were we were much more looking at how do we just use a lot less of everything and still solve the same job that that people are using cars to solve on a day in day out basis. Now I think that now that we're looking at going to mass production in the next couple of years. The, the big push now is to say, okay, for every single piece of this product, what is the right way to do this at scale? And that's when we're, we're able to bring in, you know, the latest and the greatest of EV technology that has been maturing, of course, for the last decade plus. One of the other areas I've invested in in this space is, you know, understanding the difference between the technology efficiencies and the cost. Um, and a lot, a lot of people don't understand that there's certain capabilities that we have, but when you're looking at a mass distributed vehicle and manufacturing such vehicles, that it's unrealistic in cost sometimes to have the performance and the efficiencies that you want, especially when you're looking at in the EV space or the FUV spaces you guys are working in. With Arkimoto, you know, where was that uh, fine line drawn between, because you have incredible efficiency with this product, uh, but you have low cost. 
how did you counterbalance having such great efficiency with such low cost? Well, well and that's, that's you know, when you think about EV, you know, vehicle efficiency generally, um, you know, light weighting is a really important piece of that puzzle. Uh, and the, the typical way that, that uh, vehicle, you know, I would say ex the exotic vehicle class with lightweight would be using esoteric materials, using different, uh, different new novel alloys. Um, and uh, what, what we have done really, I mean, we're building this thing out of, uh, out of steel and plastic. So the, again, the, the, the way that we have approached lightweighting is by the design architecture of the vehicle. And that, that really is kind of core to, it's core to our intellectual property portfolio is a novel way of, of really of ballasting a three-wheeled vehicle to make it uh, so that you can package, you know, two large people. I'm, I'm six foot four. I'm kind of our, our, our sizing dummy. And I fit comfortably in the front seat, comfortably in the back seat. So it's on, on a platform that's about the same size as a big touring motorcycle. Um, and yet can, uh, you know, carry either two large people comfortably or carry one person and a whole lot of stuff for our delivery version. Um, and, and by taking that approach, we get the benefit of uh, lightweight, incredible uh, efficiency, but do so at using sort of uh, low cost materials. Uh, and as, as we look down the road, we think that there are gonna be a lot of opportunities uh, for continued performance improvement, moving towards things like, you know, 3D printing of uh, algorithmically designed structures that you could never, you know, you could, things that you couldn't ever really cast uh, or couldn't build using traditional methods. As those new technologies come online, uh, they will be incremental performance improvements. But at, at a first cut, we wanted to build something that was going to be both incredibly efficient and incredibly affordable. Yeah, the other component that's so surprising, and I want to ask you a marketing question about it, is that Arkimoto safety is, you know, unparalleled. Uh, for what it looks like, you know, you, you wonder the first question that comes to your mind, uh, you know, other than you have a genre of people that are just going to, you know, that are used to motorcycles and, and the, the fear and the safety isn't an issue at all. They'll, they'll drive without a helmet. But in the mass market and in the obviously commercial delivery market, safety is a big concern. I want to know because it's so safe. How are you planning on educating and differentiating yourselves in the marketplace? Because you have such extraordinary safety uh, uh, well, it, measures and design that I sometimes those kind of things get lost just because of the look and feel of something. Yeah, and I mean, the, re the real question for us is how can we build a motorcycle class vehicle that offers a much higher level of safety than a, is typical of a bike? Right. Uh, and that's, you know, so, so we have added components to the vehicle architecture Things like, you know, a roof that passes the automotive roof crush test. We have dual three-point safety harnesses for both passengers. Uh, and, you know, one of the big challenges with, with typical small form vehicles is that they're, they're, they're hard to see, right? So one of the big safety issues with motorcycles and with very low slung micro vehicles is that you just, you don't see them on the road and you don't even necessarily have good visibility of what's going on around you. And so that, that has been definitely a component of, uh, of our thinking as we've developed the Arkimoto product. Now, there will certainly be people who say, you know, I only ever want to drive a 4,000 pound Volvo or Tesla, you know, <laughs> full size, you know, sort of uh, urban tank. And that's if, if you, you know, that is, that is definitely a, a component of, of the safety calculus. Um, but in where, where we see, Arkimoto is how can we how can we build something that is a, a a much safer motorcycle class vehicle and at the same time you know make the road safer for everybody else. Yeah, and more functional and utilitarian as well. I mean, it has so much more functionality than a motorcycle uh, in commercial and uh, you know consumer spaces. Uh, now, all the different people in your space are visionaries. Obviously you are put your money where your mouth was as being a visionary, which always to me puts you in a different category than most entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, there's two categories for me. There's the innovator that has a great idea and is allowing everybody else to pay for it. And then of course there's Mark in that class of entrepreneur that put their money where their mouth is 
from their successes. That's how much they believe in it. But the future of transportation is, of course, not certain. There's no certainty in any future, but the accelerated technology and the amount of money that's being poured in from the VC world, especially in, you know, to the commercial space, as you can see, you know, all the huge funds that are putting billions of dollars into great ideas of commercial vehicles. Where do you see the future of transportation and how does Arkimoto fit into that future? So that's a, I, that's a great question. I think what, where, where, where I see Arkimoto is really at the, it's at the, I think of it as at the confluence of a bunch of different trends in mobility, right? So vehicle electrification, that's, that's obvious. That's happening, uh, you know, that once, once the price parity is reached on the price of a new vehicle and the performance features are there, it makes no sense to buy an internal combustion machine, not to mention the fact that uh, every government around the world and finally ours uh, are really taking it seriously. Um, the, uh, the, the next steps though are, are the really fun ones, right? You've got uh, uh, autonomous vehicles are coming online in a major way. And you know, that, was, that was pure science fiction 15 years ago. And now it's actually, there are essentially robo taxis uh, driving the roads from multiple manufacturers um, you have uh, all new business models for vehicle sharing, because one of the absurd things is that a, a car spends 95% of its life just parked, gathering dust, rusting, and depreciating. And so the, when, when you have new vehicle sharing models where uh, this super underutilized asset can get shared by more people, more trips, um, that drives down the cost for everybody and obviously has a sustainability impact as well. And then you know, for us, the final piece is just a rethinking of the footprint of vehicles on the road. Because when you live in that autonomous shared electric vehicle future, to us, it makes no sense that the dominant vehicle is a five to seven passenger autonomous SUV. What makes sense to us is that you have a very human scale, ultra lightweight autonomous vehicle that is, you know, sort of is, is pennies per mile to operate. And that's really where that that's the future that we are working towards. That's that's where we see, you know, ultimately the end game for Arkimoto is developing, uh, you know, delivering what are essentially a, autonomous uh, one and two person electric rides for uh, for the masses. And that that to me is you know we have this this kind of motto of uh, parking lots to parks which is, you know, you can, when, when you've got that autonomous future, you can get rid of a bunch of the parking lots, you can get rid of a bunch of the lane miles of roads and start really utilizing uh, our, our civic footprint that right now about half of it is paved over, right? We pave over about half of our cities with asphalt and concrete to move and warehouse cars. And that's crazy. Um, it's, it, I think we can make the, the opportunity here is really to just make, make the, the, the city, the urban experience, fantastically better. Not as, not as loud, not as uh, pollutive, um, and, and much more friendly to other forms of transportation as well. Well, Mark, you're certainly a compassionate capitalist, but uh, I just appreciate what you and your beliefs have accomplished, not just with Dynamics and Garage Games uh, in a fun world, but actually applying all of that knowledge and experience to effectuate, you know, truly an impactful business that is what I call a compassionate business, one that can make money, help people and have fun uh, and enduring not only the challenges for all these years, but more importantly, I think it's really important for entrepreneurs to know this is a entrepreneur that puts his money where his mouth is. And uh, when you receive all of those honors on this time around uh, and people are like, oh yeah, Mark's an overnight success. Uh, I hope people, uh, gain the lesson that it takes a lot to make things like this happen that can truly change uh, our country and even the world. So thank you so much for the dreams, but more importantly, thank you so much for making them a reality. Uh, what a pleasure it's been here. 